Ephesians 5, verse number 22. Um, this is the weekend of relationships. Um, and if you're single, I don't want you to tap out divorce. I still want you to, to peek. I think it's helpful for everybody. And I, and I don't want, and I want to highlight as a local church this very important principle. Give me 25 minutes. That being single does not mean that you are in a holding pattern until you graduate to marriage. It's almost like, wait your turn, you're going to get married. Well, some people, that's not their season, and they're not less than because they are not married. I may be single and building, not focused on that yet, because marriage, relationships, friendships take work commitment and I may be in a season of my life where I can't devote that level of work so there's no sense of having a title change without having a heart change towards the title because your title can change and your heart could still be single all right all right so Ephesians 5 22 I'm gonna read in the message Bible it says this wives Understand and support your husbands in ways that show you support your support for Christ. The husband provides leadership to his wife the way Christ does to his church, not by domineering, but by cherishing. So just as the church submits to Christ as he exercises such leadership, wives should likewise submit to their husbands. Okay, first off, for those of you who are woke in our 21st century, I shouldn't submit. That's slavery terms. No, that's what the Western world has made you believe. Throughout all history, submission has always been a beautiful thing when you see a dance partner dancing with one another and you see one person submitting to the others. Any couples that dance? Any couples that dance? Oh, all y'all shy this morning. All right, I was going to use you as my illustration. Um, so um, when couples dance, one of them has to submit to the other for them to make their move so that they can make their move. And you see two dancing in harmony because one has chosen to submit to another. That's what true submission looks like. It is not a domineering. It is not a bossing over. So uh, a dance, I should man, I should have had a dance couple up here dancing. I'll think about it next week. All right, husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church, a love marked by giving, not getting. Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring the best out of her. Dressing her in dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness, and is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. So if I love my spouse, I'm actually loving myself. One abuses his own body, does he? No, he feeds and pampers it. That's how Christ treats us, the church, since we are part of his body. And this is why a man leaves his father and mother and cherishes his wife. He leaves his father and mother. No longer two, they become one flesh. This is a huge mystery. Paul says, I don't pretend to even understand it. What is clear to me, though, is the way that Christ treats the church. And this provides a good picture of how each husband is to treat his wife, loving himself, loving her, and how each wife is to honor her husband. So what Paul is, in essence, telling us is that this is a Paul epistle to a church group of people who are having challenges understanding marriage. Paul is single, writing to married people about being married. Some believe Paul was married before and ended up getting divorced when he decided to pursue the ministry. His wife left him. That's why some believe, because Paul says, I was a Pharisee, a Pharisee, which means to be a Pharisee, you had to be married. Okay, so now that we got that context set, um, 
this is gonna work for everybody. So here's the things I wanna talk about. I wanna talk to you about the three W's of relationships. It doesn't just apply to marriage, it applies to all relationships. God is the one that instituted marriage, so we must go back to the source that gave us marriage, which is a resource to procreate and replenish the earth, right? So let me say this in this wise. According to a recent survey of, of these therapy professionals, from across North America, the three leading causes of divorce are number one, most people would say money, it's not. It's 43% has been basic incompatibility. Number two, infidelity. Number three, money issues. The strength of the society is based on the family structure. I think this would be just a theological thing to throw out. Since, since sin was in, introduced into the earth, Genesis 3 says, woman, the curse that you will bear is that when you have a baby, you will increase with pain. That's what everybody focus on, right? You will increase with pain. But the second thing it says is that for the rest of your life, the husband will try to love you, but will be dominating over you. So the reality is because sin is in the world, whenever couples come together, there is a real reality that Satan desires to have the wife try to love the husband and the husband fight that love because he can't receive it. And if most men are honest, we can receive authentic love from other people better than we oftentimes receive it from our own spouse, which means you can receive constructive criticism from other people, but you cannot effectively receive constructive criticism from the person that loves you the most. I wanna talk about three W's because I think they're important and I think they fit to culture. Number one, I wanna talk about the word words. Words matter. And scripture says that Christ evokes the beauty of the wife by telling her the word, right? Words matter. So this is a term that I want you to write down, worldview. How you view things determines how you make your decisions. So if you say, like, I want to get married, the other person says, I want to get married, what does that mean to you? Because you do know the vows say this. The vows say, and I brought my little black book. The vow, not, it's not a black book of phone numbers. It's a black book of uh, weddings and stuff. The, the, the book says this. It says, um, uh, do you promise to, to keep her in sickness and in health, forsaking all others, uh, as long as you both shall live, right? It says, um, will you comfort her? Will you love her, honor her, keep her in joy and sorrow, preserve this bond, holy and unbroken, until the day of Jesus Christ? It says the same thing for the spouse. The question must be posed, what does that mean to you? Because words mean different things to different people. And what I found is that what you define as love may not necessarily be my same definition. I may feel that I could love you and leave you and still be in love. Words matter. Like when people say, man, I love you. What does that mean? How do you love me? Do you tell everybody you love them? It may just be like, yo, I just tell everybody I love them. That don't really mean that I'll take a bullet for you. Or what does it mean when you say, man, I will die for you? Do, I mean, I think I understand it, but what does that really mean? Because some of us will say, like, man, I'll take a bullet for you, and if someone stands in here in a gun and says it's either you or him, you're going to be like, sorry, Pastor, it's been real. <laughs> you know, your relationship with God should be intact. You're good. But we need to understand what words really mean. When you say I'm your BFF, what does that mean? because that creates an expectation that you may not really want to live up to. You're my best friend. In my mind, that means you tell me everything. And in my mind, it means like, no, I tell you everything I feel comfortable telling you. We must learn how to define words. Like, what does it mean, I'll be right back? What does it mean I'm just running to the grocery store? How long does that really look like? Now I'm upset because I got my gym clothes on thinking you're coming right back and it's not really a right back trip, right? So we need to understand what words really mean and pay attention to how you define words. 
because words matter. In Ephesians, it says clearly that the way you evoke beauty in a woman is by speaking words. Isn't it amazing that words can get you into a bed that you don't want to be in? It weren't just looks. It was the words. It was the words that got a woman to eat a fruit. It was words that got a man to eat a fruit. It was words that made a woman start to have consciousness about her insecurities that weren't even told to her, but she was informed about it by a serpent that introduced her to things that she didn't even have attention to. But because of the power of his words, words, words are powerful. Words are like painting a picture. The tongue is like a paintbrush. When you use it, it paints pictures. And if you're really good, you can paint a picture just by using your words. If your words are really good, I can take you to Paris and you never even left Orlando, but I could paint a picture so good that you felt that you walked through the airport and TSA stopped you. And when they stopped you, you saw the dogs and the dogs were sniffing your bags. And when they started to sniff your bags, you were waiting in line. And as you started to wait, you saw the monorail about to take you to the next spot. And you looked at your ticket and wondered, what gate am I at? And you realized, I'm at gate 57. You looked up and saw that you were in the right place place and as the bus started to come as the monorail started to come you waited patiently in line because you saved up all your money in your mind you worked all them extra hours for this moment and now you're finally at this moment words have the power to take you places you don't want to go words all right so words words are words are a powerful collection of ability is words. So now, here's the thing. Words are powerful. So now, here's the other thing. Here, here it is. Here's the, here's the other thing. The way to destroy an effective relationship is to use your words through text. The, the way to destroy a beautiful sense of communication is to reduce your intellectual ability to characters and text. Have you ever said something in words, in text, and you did not even mean what the other person interpreted? So the danger of even friendships is that when you are having a hostile conversation, it is best not to use text to communicate your words. See, these are the nuances that they did not have back in the biblical culture. In the biblical culture, I picked your wife, we had no problems, that's what it was. Words are a powerful thing, and if you talk in text, you'll lose every time. I've made a commitment, I'm not talking to anybody that I disagree with in text. Because it's never going to be processed. Because, here, here it is, the greatest challenge for most people is communication. Communication is not what you say, it is how it's received. Communication is the transmission of language to another. If you don't communicate right, even though you meant it, if it was interpreted wrong, you did not communicate effectively. You cannot blame the receptacle that did not receive your communication properly. Sometimes you have to stop and ask people, what did you get out of my words? Number two, not just words matter, but here is the other piece that I think is important, work. Relationships require work. Any relationship that you want to keep must be worked on. That doesn't just mean marriage, it means friendship. If, if you tell me, man, that's my BF, we can pick up where we left off. Yeah, that may be true in some instances, but an effective relationship requires work. And if you are not careful, you will work on things that don't matter and lose things that do matter. Work is the prime. So incompatibility is why people fall out of relationships because an effective relationship, whether it's marriage, whether it's dating, it's all built on the same premise as friendship. But because of the world that we live in that makes us work so much, we spend so much time at the office so less time working on our relationships 
that we really are in love, but we just have nothing in common anymore. Because work requires you to go 50 hours a week, 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, some of you 80 hours a week. But if you don't spend any of those times in your relationship, then you've lost what really matters. Because the real reason why most people work is to provide a life that will be glorious, that will be beautiful, so that they can enjoy. But if you work all your days to provide a life that's glorious and beautiful, and then you don't have the people to share it with, so here's what I oftentimes say. Don't go up the, don't get to the mountain and leave the people at the bottom that matter the most when you get there. All relationships are work. And if you're single, you may be in a space where like, I am not cut out for that level of work. I don't want to get to know someone's weakness, strengths, all those type of things. I don't have that within me. Relationships require work. It requires getting together and doing things together. That's not just marriage. Don't just reduce it to marriage. It's friendships. It's, it's, it's having things in common. And you may not like what I like, but sometimes you got to learn what I like so that we can like something in common. I hate Valentine's Day. I don't like days that force you to do something that should be natural to you, right? So yeah, you celebrate and all that good stuff. But some of us put so much pressure in a performance-based relationship. Performance-based relationships never work because you will never perform well enough for anybody. That's why relational equity with God is not based on performance. Relational equity with God is based on grace because you will never do anything good enough to obtain the love of God. And if you feel that you got to work for the love of God, it's not going to be very effective because there's nothing you can do that can satisfy an eternal God. Performance-based relationships don't work because they're only based on performance. And when you stop performing, I stop feeling validated by you. Right? Performance-based relationships don't work. That's why I, in my book that's in the bookstore that's on sale for $10, um, we, we talk about recalibrating your relational IQ because a lot of times we are, re, we are defining people wrong and then we're giving them the wrong expectation. Right? If you work for me, it's a job. If you leave me, it doesn't mean you don't like me. It just means you found a better job. No, you're supposed to be with me for life. You're supposed to ride and die for me. No, I just work here. <laughs> right? and, and if you don't have the right relational definitions, you'll have a loyalty to something that doesn't have a loyalty to you, and you'll feel betrayed when they fire you, and they'll look at you and say, this ain't a marriage, this is a job relationship. That's why I said you and I must learn how to define words. Words are important. But here's the other thing. The third one is, and I'm going to jump back to work, but the third word is worth, W-O-R-T-H. I know we live in a cancel culture where Jesus is pretty clear. Marriage is like the church. The church is worth it. Jesus died for the church. So even if we say we don't need it, Jesus is like, well, then why did I waste my blood? Like the church is a valuable institution that God uses as the educational arm to the kingdom. The church is not a place to give us a crack addiction for breakthrough. I need to go to church because I need to get my breakthrough. No, you need to go to church so you can learn what God is saying so that you can apply it to your day-to-day -day living. Because some of us are expert at church and we're terrible at life. Right? So here it is, worth. You and I must define what's worth it to us. Because we live in a cancel culture, because some of you change BFFs every three years. I mean, you done built three years worth of relationships with a person, and then you're going to cancel them to get someone else that you're going to start all over with to realize they have the same faults or maybe different. But sometimes we must determine, is it worth letting that relationship go? Because I must determine the value of worth. Worth is important because not everybody weighs the same in our lives. If you offend me, it may not bother me as much because you don't weigh that much. 
which is even crazier, that some of us let people who don't weigh anything affect our entire mood. Like, if you let a person on social media determine your entire day who has no weight and who is a virtual existence of a person, you got to determine weight, what weighs the most. But this is a thing that I picked up at a conference I thought was pretty cool, and I want to talk to you about work. And this work is important for all of us. This is the picture slide that I want to show you. Um, and I, I want to thank Bravis for making this at um, 6 in the morning. Um, so, so these are different areas that all of us need. And if the number one need of, of relational dysfunction is incompatibility, then the reason why there's incompatibility is because one of these areas are not being met or several of these areas are not being met and then our work husband or our work wives are meeting them. So number one is acceptance. Everyone wants to feel accepted. If you're not accepted at home, if you're not accepted in friendships, you're going to have a hard time being the best version of yourself. If you have to pretend to be someone else so that you can be accepted in a relationship, that's probably not a very effective relationship to be in. Because relationships should, relationship should be a place and space that you can be authentically you. You know you're in love when she takes that wig off and you can see the corn rolls and <laughs> that's love. <laughs> Affirmation. So here's the thing. If you don't have these things as an adult, then you get married hoping your partner will give you these things. And then when they don't give you these things, we are now no longer compatible because I expected you to be the savior to my childhood. So really the challenge that we have is we have children marrying children and we're hoping that the marriage will make us an adult. And marriage just highlights who you really are. Affirmation, some people are grown and need affirmation. You need to stop and tell them you're doing a great job. If you're one of those people, then you need to communicate that's what you need because those words matter to you. And if you go, if you are deficit in that area, you will find anyone to fill it for you. That's why social media is so popular because we live in a world that needs affirmation. I want to hear congratulations. I want to hear I'm doing well. Man, oh my God, I, this only got 15 shares. I thought it would get more because we, we are so dying of affirmation because we're so busy in our day-to-day -day lives that people don't stop and look at us. They don't tell us anymore, man, that's a nice outfit. Oh, we're looking, I want, I'm, I'm gonna shut it down and no one tells you that you shut it down because everybody's too busy looking at their phones. So we need affirmation, we need affection. Some people need affection and that's, if that's you, then you need to communicate that to your spouse because sometimes you're incompatible because you're not getting the affection that you need, but then you're getting the affection from other places because you're drying up in that area. Appreciation. Everybody wants to feel appreciated. The challenge. So all of these, I don't want you to look at these things as this is what someone needs to give me and this is why I am the way I am. You need to look at these and say, where am I missing it? And how can I work? Because if I try to work on you and don't work on me, then the whole marriage is going to go down because I'm going to be broken because I'm expecting you to fix the areas of my brokenness without addressing myself. Yeah. Remember, I always tell people, you can't self-diagnose yourself. You need someone close to you and say, tell me where I'm missing it. You can't tell, I can't look at it and say, yup, my wife got acceptance, yup, she got affirmation, yup, she got affection, yup, she got appreciation, because I'm always going to grade myself on a curve. And you've got to be willing for her to grade you and not be offended, because remember what I started with, sometimes we receive constructive criticism from people that don't love us, and the people that do love us, we have a hard time receiving it. Appreciation, we need to be appreciated, we need to be appreciated. Encouragement, encouragement. Some people need encouragement. Some for men, the highest thing is, and, and notice that scripture is pretty clear. Scripture doesn't say men need affection. 
even though it's true that men do, in the passage that we read. The passage that we read says, and the wives will honor the husband, which is a highlight that women need to give men honor. Because respect is one of the greatest attributes that men look for. Ain't get no help from the brothers in the church. Amen. <laughs> Because God knew how he created us. He created us in such a way that he says, no, men, you need to do all this for women because they need all this. They need love. They need affection. They need this. And, and he says, but the woman will honor him because respect will keep him coming home. Yeah, you re respect will keep him coming home. Security. Some people need Security. They need to know that if I tell you something, it's not going to be told to somebody else. That deals also with character, too. But it's also security, knowing that if I confide in you, it's said. It's set. It's not leaving this place. That's security. Support. In relational terms, some people really need support. They, they need help with the kids. They need that. So you, if, if you are, some parents, <laughs> I might get in trouble for this. Um, probably will, but it's okay. So um, some people say, like, my kids are my valentine, which may be true. That may be absolutely true. Your kids may be the joy of your life. But here's one element of danger if you're in a relational context. I re I'll never forget listening to a radio show where the guy says, my husband left me after 46 years of marriage. And I was thinking, when did you realize it was wrong? Like 46 years? I mean, you wasted, I mean, at 20, you could have just kind of shoot her a text like, babe, we're in trouble. But you waited 46 years. And she said, we spent our entire lives raising our kids. It was all about the 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 kids. About the kids. And when the kids grew up, we ain't know each other. My pastor uses a great line, and I love it. He says, I'd rather my kids cry on date night than cry in divorce court. It's a real truth. Support, people, we, we need support. We need, we need attention, we need comfort. We need comfort. Now, it's a great homework exercise. You take a picture of it, and, or if you grab a friend and say, where do you think I need help at? Now be prepared for the answers. Because if you're single, whether you're a business person, I need to know, are you secure in who you are? Because if I bring another business partner in to give us advice, are you going to be jealous that they're going to take your place and now you're going to sabotage your partner because you don't have security in yourself? So it, it's, it's, it, is important, it is important to know. I was going to bring a, a, the, the Jenga, you know, the, the thing that you, you stack. So, so in relationships, love is something that we give to people. Trust is something that is earned. When trust is broken, it's like it don't matter how high you build that Jenga piece. If you take the bottom down, all of it comes crashing down. And so it is the same thing in relationships. Trust is a high priority for some people. And you and I must understand that trust is not something that we're entitled to. You have to prove you're trustworthy. Paul tells Timothy this, lay your hands on no man suddenly. Make sure that they are trustworthy of the office that you're trying to assign them to. And you don't know people are trustworthy until you see them in all seasons. Don't just fall in love with someone you just met in the spring. Because you haven't seen their winter yet. Right? Sometimes we fall in love with the presentation. Everybody does good the first 90 days. They're the model employee the first 90 days. Because they do just enough not to get fired. And how many people have you committed a long-term relationship to that just did just enough not to get fired? When you, when you label people titles, they must earn that title. Confidant. That's not something that someone gains in six months. 
confidants are people that are long-term. And relationships could go long-term if we were willing and okay with working on every element of relationships as opposed to canceling them and starting all over. And I know that's what culture tells us. Just, just start all over. Get somebody else. Move on with your life. Find a new friend. Find a new BFF. You'll have a better life. But at what point do we stop and say, let me just work on what I have? Because I could build a new, but I'd have wasted eight years. That doesn't mean to fall and try to build in toxic situations. But what I am saying is, is that no relationship is perfect. No job is perfect. No career is perfect. No business is perfect. So what would make you believe that your relationship's going to be perfect? This is not just relationships. This is marriage. This is friendships. This is, nothing is going to be 100% perfect. We just got to work on it. And we got to talk, not text, and communicate where we are because you cannot hold people accountable for what you don't tell them. If you are in a season where you're like, listen, I just, this month I just really need affection. I feel like I'm ugly. I feel like I'm skinny. I feel like I'm overweight. I feel like my legs are too small. I feel like my cheeks are too big. If you let a person know, they know how to minister to you. Don't go to the doctor, show up at the appointment, and he asks you what's wrong, and then you try to hide where you're hurting. Because I can't heal what you don't reveal. And there is a possibility that the only reason why your relationships don't work is not everybody else, it's you. And in church, it is the most nauseating gospel I have ever heard where we get so excited when we talk about, and they left your life and you're going to make it and they destroyed you and you're going to make it. But sometimes I wonder, maybe I destroyed it. Maybe it wasn't them. Maybe it was my childlike insecurities or the areas that I did not get as a child that manifested and they said, you know what, I'm too grown to be your daycare worker. So we can't always be a society that wants to find why everybody else is responsible for our dysfunction. And if you grew up in a parent's household that was challenging, or you grew up in a household that shaped these areas of your life, then you need to know that because that's going to help you be a better relational person. I'm a loyalist. And because I'm a loyalist, I'll never, I will slowly give my heart to someone because once you have it, I'll follow you wherever you go. So because I know that's my strength and weakness, then I must be slow on who I am think is worthy of giving my affection and attention to and they may say you're standoffish and they may say you're this but no you're just protecting yourself from being damaged by someone else who doesn't value the same standards you have because just because you are a loyalist doesn't mean everybody else is the same way and and here's the thing we oftentimes think our strength equates to the other person on the other end. So just because people feel comfortable sharing their life with you doesn't mean you have to reciprocate the favor. Because marriage or joining of friendships or, or partnerships, it doesn't work if you're both dysfunctional. Man, I want to I want to come work because here, here's the here's the other. I use these five C's. Pastor Vernon gave these, I think, uh, and we add on to them. So number one, you want to deal with people who have character. If they don't have character, it doesn't matter how gifted they are, they just don't have character. If you tell me that it was five dollars and your receipt says it was a dollar, you have no character. Some people have character, but they don't have competence. You can't make people competent. Number three is chemistry. If I'm going to bring you into my group, you may have character, you may have competence, but if I feel your chemistry is going to be bad, I'm not going to bring you in. I'm not going to sacrifice culture for the sake of character 
competence in chemistry. You need chemistry, character, competence, chemistry. And you also need this other one that I say. You need cadence. Being able to move at the beat of the drum. Because like, you talk to like, man, y'all church always doing something. Okay, well, you don't have the cadence for it. Go join old school, First Wood, Ebenezer, Baptist Church of the Firstborn Brethren that's been having a building fund since 1825. That might be the church for you because it's always going to be the same. It's never going to change. You need people that can follow your chemistry, that has, a, that has chemistry with you, that has cadence, that can move with you. And lastly, let me tell you this. Don't stay married miserable. Go get it fixed. Because if you, okay, this, this, this is going to be a good one. Have you ever drove your car and the light came on? And you just thought, man, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. Or let me just restart the car, and then it'll go away. And the longer you sit there, the light keeps going. And then all of a sudden, it starts activating all other lights because you did not give attention to the one that really mattered. If your marriage has lights going on, you are not weak to go get counseling. You are not less spiritual to sit and have an advisor tell you what you need to do. If you are spiritual and single and you realize there are areas in your life that you prayed on that are not helping, you were raped as a child you were abused and you grow up now and you realize I can't love people properly because of where I am go get help if your mind is sick you need a doctor you're not judged when your leg is hurt and you go get a doctor you're not judged when your arm is hurt and you go get a doctor sometimes this mind needs a doctor and you're free and black people especially you got to be willing to say, you know what, I need counseling. Don't say, oh, it's going to work itself out. It doesn't. A dance won't change it. If you were crazy when you came in, the praise break ain't going to loosen it. Sometimes, y'all, I know it's Black History Month, sometimes the greatest detriment to our culture it's because for history, we've experienced so much strength that we haven't learned how to be weak. And it's killing us. I'm trying to balance all the kids. And, and if, if you're a single mom, you may, need, you may need the support. I have my kids for a couple hours. And I'm online like, is there a return policy here? Because this, this, you know, it's... it's it's overwhelming if you're a single mom. It's, it's just overwhelming. And sometimes you just need to put your, I need help. If the light is broken in your relational structure, go get it fixed. Because here's what we do. We think, I'm going to make this work so my kids could see us, so my kids aren't hurt. You're hurting your kids either way. Because now you're teaching your kids that dysfunction is what marriage is. And your kids aren't going to want to get married. And when they do get married, they're going to model what they saw. Father, help us. We all need it. None of us have it perfect. And none of us are perfect, but if... If we, if we can mirror what you did, you sacrificed. You humbled yourself from the position you were in to help the bride get washed. So today, I pray every one of us has relationships that matter, that value, that are valuable to us. And sometimes we bring ourselves to the table and we're the incomplete part of the transaction. Help me have the courage to look in the mirror and see my blemishes without makeup and address them. Help me not to conceal areas that I don't appreciate, but help me to be authentically okay with revealing the areas that are not as pretty to me. 
so that I might be healthy and grow and be better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you took a picture of that, um, they'll have it to take a picture of. But seriously, ask people you care or that care about you, like, where, where do you think I'm missing? Or fill it out yourself. Like, where do you feel like you're empty at? Like, where do you feel like you're, where do you feel like you're lacking? Because self-improvement is something that you should take into consideration. Because you're going to live with this self for a long time.